In this episode of the LifeWorks podcast, I was really trying to understand Afghanistan. And so I thought I would talk to not someone who's covered the news story, but rather someone who was actually on the ground working with the Afghan people. I decided to interview Laszlo Palko. Laszlo is a two-tour veteran of Afghanistan, and he's also a Harvard-educated professional in the area of public policy and government. So his perspective, not only as a soldier, but also as an academic, studying government is absolutely fascinating. He has an incredible story, and he talks about the objectives that we had going into Afghanistan, what we hope to accomplish, what we did accomplish, and what the impact is of the United States pulling out at this time. What's significant about this particular interview is that we recorded it on Memorial Day weekend of 2021, which is meaningful in and of itself. When we are releasing it, as of the date that we are releasing it, the United States has made the decision to pull out. Evacuations are moving speedily in progress and the Taliban has taken over the entire country, not within 90 days as the intelligence assessment originally called for, but rather in a matter of less than two weeks, probably, if not in a matter of days. So I hope you enjoy this episode of the LifeWorks podcast, and I hope it's as illuminating and enlightening to you as it was to me. If you had questions about why we were in Afghanistan, this is the video for you. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the LifeWorks Podcast. Joining me today is Laszlo Palco. Laszlo, it is great to have you on the podcast today. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be with you. So, Laszlo, we're going to talk about Afghanistan. And you were a veteran of Afghanistan. And to me, Afghanistan seems to be a misunderstood war. We've been there so long, and I don't know that people have a common understanding of why we were there, why we were there for so long, and what we accomplished or even hope to accomplish. So, in our conversation, what I'm hoping to understand is just to get a little bit of a history lesson on what motivated the United States and its allies to go into Afghanistan in the first place, knowing that this land has been long contested. The Russians were there for eons, but even before the United States, what the objectives were, what it was really like to be there from someone who is actually on the ground and not not just some news story and what the implications are of the United States pulling out at this point. So I'm really glad that you're with me today to address some of these questions. So let me just start right off by asking, who was the enemy in Afghanistan? Who were the bad guys? Sure. And then thank you, Mark. And before I answer that, I just again want to thank you for having me on and discuss this important topic. It's incredibly important for all those who went to Afghanistan, for those who didn't come back and their families, um, Absolutely. And the Afghan people in the world. Who was the enemy? It, it, it was defined early on. It, it goes into the objectives of what we were trying to accomplish. The first two objectives define the enemy. The third objective was just a sustainable strategy to keep the enemy from coming back. So the first enemy was Al-Qaeda and their allies. Who is Al-Qaeda? It's a radical, militant, Islamist organization uh, seeking to impose theocracy, reestablish the caliph, who employ terrorist tactics and certain global insurgency to help them achieve their objectives and their offshoots in Iraq and, and Syria ended up creating the Islamic State to try to make that a reality. But before the Islamic State, there was Al-Qaeda. We had been ramping up attacks on the United States through a global insurgency, if you want to call it, to drive the United States out of the Middle East so that they could accomplish their goal of creating the caliph of theocracy, if you will, through military means and oppression. They were the first enemy. They, the 9-11, of course, woke us up finally to uh, who they were and the threat that they posed to us and the fact that they killed 3,000 of our uh, fellow Americans and people from all over the world who were working in the 
World Trade Center. Uh, they were a threat to, to all humans who, who aspire to have a peaceful life and to promote liberty, liberal governance. And I say liberal, of course, I mean uh, freedom. So they were an enemy towards that and those goals. And so after 9-11, we decided to launch a war against Al-Qaeda. The term war on terror was a foolish one uh, to employ. I was 18 years old, so I didn't really think of it back then. But as I reflected, it was a stupid terminology to utilize. It should have been focused on Al-Qaeda and its allies. It was a kind of share the same ideology uh, as Al-Qaeda. That's who the threat was. Terrorism is a tactic that they employ, but it really mushed things up and, and created, you know, it's a political mess. But so Al-Qaeda was the threat. Where they were based out of was Afghanistan. The Taliban regime had opened their arms to Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda had been in different parts. They started originally in Afghanistan and Pakistan in the 1980s fighting the Soviet Union, then became a global organization. They were removed from Sudan, and then they ended up back in Afghanistan where the Malomar and the Taliban kind of welcomed them. They had operational camps there where they trained for the operation, the 9-11 operation, and for other attacks around the world. So after 9-11, that was the target. That's who we went to war with. So we... Uh, were there to destroy Al-Qaeda. That was enemy number one, objective number one, if you will. Enemy number two, which became objective number two, was we first asked the Taliban to stop being an ally of Al-Qaeda. We're going to give you an opportunity here to become, the, to not be an ally anymore of Al-Qaeda and I'll turn them in, arrest them and turn them into the international community in the United States for, for trial or for, for capture so that we could stop any future attacks and bring to justice those who did 9-11. Uh, the Taliban refused to do so because they, while they don't necessarily share the, the same global vision of the caliph, they do share their an offshoot. You have the Al Qaeda, which has roots in Wahhabism uh, created in, in Saudi Arabia that believes in the recreation of the global caliph. The Taliban has, uh, it's a different kind of uh, element called the Obandism, which is a little bit more localized in the Pakistan, Afghanistan, maybe central Asia region. So the Taliban wasn't as interested in kind of global jihad. They were more interested in Afghanistan, a little bit in the, more in the Central Asia because of their Pakistani uh, supporters, but they certainly were friends with Al-Qaeda. They, they accepted that what Al-Qaeda was doing was a good thing, but they shared, they supported them without necessarily wanting to be involved in global jihad beyond providing them the operational basis from where they can uh, operate out of. So once they refused and stated that they were allies of Al-Qaeda, well, then they became our enemy as well. So that was, a, that became a, the second enemy, the second objective, destroy the Taliban. It, and it wasn't initially because the Taliban was a brutal, oppressive, authoritarian regime, which they were. That wasn't the reason why we went against it. And it was a, a good end result of what we hoped to accomplish was ending a tyrannical, brutal regime that, that brutalized its people. That was a good thing for us to do, but it wasn't the initial reason why we went in. It was because they were allied with Al Qaeda, the one who was our enemy, and they became an ally, they remained an ally of them. So they became our enemy and our second objective to drive out the Taliban and to keep them out of Afghanistan and destroy them. Those were the enemies, like the actual enemies that we conducted combat with. That's a little bit simplified because other entities began bringing up there's offshoots there there was the the Haqqani network and other elements that were allied right Afghanistan is a very complex place with multiple tribes and sub tribes and, and allegiances and many organizations but the the framework was think of it as al-qaeda the Taliban and their allies or maybe short-term allies because maybe once the Taliban took power some of these other groups necessarily wouldn't accept them either but at least during the war against the United States and the Afghan government those were our enemies that we were conducting combat with. The third objective was preventing. So if you destroy Al Qaeda and the Taliban, you want to have it be a sustainable solution. So people could argue, yeah, limited objective, take out Al Qaeda and the Taliban and then get out. Okay. That's one way to do things, but it doesn't, that could be a short-term solution because they could just come back. And then now you have the same problem again. It's an easier way to do things. And you can argue it's, it's a way of doing things, right? You can just keep doing that. I'm not saying that's the wrong way to do it, but we took the approach of let's create a sustainable solution called Afghanistan. That's uh, a new government that would keep the Taliban and Al Qaeda out and not allow them to reestablish their foothold again in Afghanistan to conduct this global insurgency against the United States and uh, our allies across the world and in the Middle East. And to create that sustainable solution, it was to create that Afghan government, the Afghan army, and create that solution that can keep them out there. The kinetic component, which is the military operation, the objective one and two, Al-Qaeda and Taliban destroying or defeating and driving out of Afghanistan was quite successful. The military is very good at conventional warfare. 
where the military was let down was in objective three by the political leadership in Washington and in global capitals who did not create that legitimate, sustainable political solution, which is paramount for any successful counterinsurgency operation, the political solution, the ultimate solution for victory, the, the military strategy of counterinsurgency, the troop to population ratio, the winning hearts and minds, driving out, separating the insurgents from the human terrain, right? What Mao Zedong called the keep the fish in the water, right? The water were the people, the fish were the insurgents. So to win the insurgency, he had to keep the water. He had to keep the people. So to develop a counterinsurgency, you had to drive the fish out of the water, keep them away from the people, have the people ally with you. So that's the military component, but that's just to enable the time and effort to create a legitimate, political, sustainable solution that the people then could side with. That wasn't done and hasn't been done. And that's why Afghanistan is where it is today. A lot of poor mistakes, even militarily as well. The military did its best with limited resources. The whole Iraq thing took a lot of resources and focused away from Afghanistan militarily, but we did our best with what we had there. We never really did counterinsurgency Afghanistan. We, we quote unquote adopted the strategy during the Obama administration's surge in Afghanistan, but counterinsurgency is a resource strategy as well beyond just a, how you conduct operations, right? And we never had the resources to properly do counterinsurgency. You have to have the right troop to population ratio to be able to drive the insurgents away from the human terrain or the, the local population. And we never did that. You know, so we never did the military solution and we certainly did not do the political solution correctly. And this is why now after 20 years, uh, we're going to be leaving and potentially, uh, you know, likely, uh, a failed, uh, strategy. Do you, so it's been 20 years. Is pulling out now a good idea? I think it's horrible. I think for many reasons, before I, I guess I go into specific Afghanistan, I want to bring up the Korean war. I know it's, it's, it's a different war, but it's, you'll understand why I'm bringing that one up. The, the Korean war, if your objective, so we're still in South Korea, 70 years after the Korean War, which means timelines aren't that paramount, right? Afghanistan is definitely a bigger threat from an annual perspective of risk to troop levels. But if North Korea starts a war again with South Korea, it's the, the U.S. military that's there is at severe risk, much more risk than Afghanistan. So it has the potential to be a very risky proposition for any U.S. soldier who's in South Korea if that war ever becomes kinetic again. But we've been there for 70 years. We've maintained troops there. If you define the Korean War goal, objective, as creating a unified Korean government that was allied with the United States, you could argue that we failed. We didn't do that. Objectively, yes. Correct. If you, if you talk to South Koreans, we didn't fail, right? We accomplished a better result than what was there. What was happening was you had an ally, a South Korean government who was going to be overrun by an evil communist regime, uh, backed by, uh, communist China and the Soviet Union. We we're going to overrun them, overrun our allies. We stepped in while we were unable to create a unified Korean country that they were before, that would be our ally. We at least prevented our allies from being overrun. And they have been a prosperous nation who've been a great contributor to global peace and order and a great friend to the United States. And we protected our friends and our allies. So from that perspective, our objective was accomplished. But again, if you had the objective of all in unified Korean government that was our ally or all out, we just got out of Korea and let the South get overwhelmed. Both of those would be failures, but the modern day solution or what we created was actually a success. So why I bring that up is because it's very reminiscent. It's not exact. Afghanistan is much more complicated than, than Korea. There's a lot of ethnic groups there. There's a lot going on in Afghanistan that make it complex. There's no established governments of certain groups or uh, a Northern region versus the Southern region. So it makes it a little bit more complex. I would argue before 9-11, you could have done something like that, but nonetheless, if we define success as controlling, if we determine at this point, because of our, our foolish strategy over the last 20 years, that we can no longer keep the Taliban out of the ethnic majority Pashtun areas in the East and the South, that doesn't mean we have to give up on the North and the West, where you have the uh, minority Tajiks, uh, Uzbeks, uh, Hazaras, uh, the Turkmen's other groups who are not allied with the Taliban. You don't have to give up on your allies. It's not all in, let's just stay in, in Afghanistan or all out. There is a third option. And unfortunately in most politics today, it's always uh, a duality. We have two choices, right? Republican or Democrat, 
big government and little government, force or diplomacy, right? The, there's always a third option and we never evaluate what those third options are. And if we, I argue that we could have accomplished our initial objective three that I defined earlier, if we had the right political solution, we didn't do that. And at this point it may be impossible to do, but instead of completely giving up, we should identify who our allies are. We know who they are. We should uh, make sure that they're properly armed and we should provide them air support and not give up on them. I'm not advocating for putting a U.S. Army infantry division there uh, to support them, but, but we can certainly support them through air power and providing them air power can at least prevent the worst case of the Taliban taking over the entire country. So I'm not advocating for active army fighting in Afghanistan. The ship has sailed on that. We've gotten the strategy wrong, but if we're going to now withdraw, we should at least identify who our allies are, maintain an air base there, uh, maintain those contacts with who our allies are, continue to provide them air support. Now, I guess first we're going to try to keep the Afghan government afloat. I think that's a long-term losing solution. I don't think they're a legitimate government. We learned that the, the hard way in South Vietnam. You can't keep supporting a government that's not legitimate with the local people. You have to understand what is legitimate and support that. And we didn't do that. We didn't look at Afghan history. We didn't look at Afghan culture and understand what kind of governance structure would actually work there. And I saw firsthand what could actually work and it was never implemented in Afghanistan and maybe too late to implement it in Afghanistan, but at least we can do so for uh, the ethnic minorities who, who fought with us there, who are allies. It's very reminiscent of Iraq. If we determine we can't create a stable ally in Sunni Arab or Shia Arab lands, that doesn't mean we give up on our Kurdish friends who want to be our friends, who are our allies, who fought alongside us, who bled alongside us. We don't give up on them. Just like in Afghanistan, that we have people there who helped us with objective one and two early on. They helped us defeat the Taliban and, and Al Qaeda. They lost their lives doing that. So they, these are good allies that we should not just abandon. What was the attitude of the Afghani people toward the United States? Were they resentful, helpful, thankful, get out you imperialist pigs? What was their attitude toward the United States while we've been there? Very mixed. Afghans are very independent and they're not going to be told what to do. And again, that was a big part of the problem of our political strategy because we were trying to tell them the globe, not just the United States. UN, the bond agreement, the DIAG program, but we were trying to tell them what to do and impose our values and saying things like Sharia should not be allowed. And, and we were imposing our values on them. And you don't do that to the Afghan people. They are very proud, independent people. So for the United States there, when I met with the warlords and, and, and the others who had fought in the eighties and were now commanders and other people there, um, they were okay with our presence initially. We supported them in the eighties. They didn't forget that. They said we formed a relationship where you helped us out and now you helped us drive out the Taliban. We're good with the United States. When British troops and Canadians arrived who they thought were British, they remembered the Anglo-Afghan war. They didn't want them there. When Eastern European troops were there, they thought they were Russian. They did not want them. So I know we always try to do things from a global strategy. I know that's politically the popular thing to do. It doesn't always make sense on the ground. And we found that out because if you remember, kinetically, Afghanistan wasn't as bad as Iraq until 2005. And what happened in 2005, there was a couple of things. Local groups and militia were keeping the Taliban out, big mistake. And then we also introduced NATO troops, the British and Canadian sound RC South, the Southern part of Afghanistan. And again, I told you those, they did not forget the wars that their grandfathers fought. They weren't too happy with them there. And you started seeing the Taliban start doing a lot of raids. You can go back and look at them in Southern Afghanistan, 400, 500 Taliban fighters attacking Canadian and British posts starting to create legitimate inroads again with the people. And then that started spreading throughout the South and the East as well. We made some critical mistakes at that point, but even with us, they said, well, we were, they were initially okay with us being there. If we kept doing what were called nighttime raids, where we go into their homes where their women are uncovered and to arrest people. And sometimes, unfortunately you have casualties, a child gets shot on accident or collateral damage, you turn the people against you. They're not going to accept that. And we wouldn't accept that. If a foreign power was in our country, raiding our homes at, at night, arresting us, I don't think the American people would stand for that. And I always reminded our, our, my fellow soldiers about that, that you got to put yourself in their shoes here, right? You, you, no one wants a foreign occupying power there, raiding their homes and taking those actions. So we were losing that goodwill that we had created in the eighties by supporting them and defeating the Soviet Union, the goodwill of driving the Taliban out and investing a lot of money, trying to help them build a better society. We were losing that goodwill because we never decided on whether we were going to go full counterinsurgency or counterterrorism. They're two different strategies. 
and we didn't have a uni unity of effort, unity of command, we did not have it. And that's a violation of, a, of an important management principle. What are you most concerned about if the United States leaves Afghanistan now? It's kind of multiple components for why I don't think we should withdraw. There's multiple aspects to it. First, the Afghan people who, who worked with us, who bled alongside us, who remain there, who are good people, who are ethnic minorities, who can be brutalized and murdered uh, by the Taliban when they return. These are good people that, that we lived with, that we, we got to know, that just are like you and me. We, they want to have a family. They want to have a, a good life. And they don't want to be brutalized by a regime. So I'm very worried about them. I'm hoping we can do our best to, to help them get out or at least to defend themselves, like I argued before. So I'm worried about them. I'm worried from a uh, national security standpoint, right? Where we had allies there. If we want to be successful in our foreign policy, we have to have alliances. And by definition, to have alliances, you need allies. When you start abandoning your allies, it's difficult to maintain the support of alliances, right? And again, by withdrawing, are we then enabling the recreation of a, a foothold, not just for the Taliban, but for the Islamic State, for Al Qaeda, for these groups that again, will look to destabilize the Middle East and continue their global insurgency and conduct attacks here again. And then third, from a veteran's perspective, those who did not come back, our brothers and sisters who did not come back and their families here at home, if we leave and this war is a failure because we just aren't looking at a third way of doing things, what did they die for? You're a father, right? Can you imagine losing your child for what? For nothing. If we fail, we owe it to them. They are the best of our citizens. Those families who, who remain here alone without a father, without a spouse, without their child, we owe it to them to come up with a successful solution so their deaths are not in vain. And I get it. If there was no solution, I understand why you want to stop the bleeding. You want to stop any further veterans from being killed and creating more gold star families. You want to stop that. But when you have an opportunity to have a successful solution, you have, it's your duty to, to support low. Those are American citizens. They're, they're constituents, just like everyone else. So we talk about policy and providing policy support, healthcare support, other things to people. These are our people as well. And they deserve that, that means that their loss was not for nothing, but it was for making the world a better place. And I argue creating that maybe two Afghanistans or whatever ends up happening, but allowing our allies there to defend themselves and to not allow the Taliban to take full control, that's a still victory. That's why I brought up the Korean example there, because that is still victory. And that means that uh, the friends that I lost did not die in vain. And I know that's that third, I, I made some you know, logical arguments before about national security and alliances. And, and the third ones, it's policy oriented and towards serving constituents in America. It's also emotional. It, it is. And, but I don't think emotions are bad. I think every policy decision has emotional component. People who are advocating for more healthcare, expansion of healthcare, that's an emotional argument. You don't want people dying. People are arguing against climate change. That's an emotional argument as well. There's emotional elements. Those who argue for freedom and limited government are, are doing it from an emotional standpoint as well. Emotions without logic is where you get yourself. You have to have the logical foundations as well. Just like logic without emotions is going to get you in trouble. We're not robots. Emotions tell you what is right, wrong, just. Logic tells you how to accomplish those things. You need both. And there's a logical and an emotional argument for why this is terrible, what we're going to do. And the fact that we're going to do it in the 20 year anniversary is a smack in the face for every soldier who died there and for the families who are back here. Now you signed up for two tours. Why did you do that? So I just turned 18 when 9-11 happened. I wanted to do something, but our, our leadership wasn't asking for uh, the big military operation. It ended up happening in 2003 with Iraq and then in, in Afghanistan started again later. So after 9-11, I was ready to join in response to, to the 9-11 attacks. And I ended up signing up two years after when I felt, okay, now I was needed. And the reason for that, there's multiple reasons. Number one, that was my generation. Those are people of our, of our generation who were asked to make the world a better place at this time. And I, I couldn't live with myself if, if I let people my generation go and do that. And I wouldn't be a part of it. I wouldn't be standing there by them, by their side and helping them out with that effort. Number two, my parents are both immigrants. They both escaped economic oppression and my father political oppression to come to the United States and form a much better life for themselves and for their children, for my brothers and sisters and I. So I felt an obligation to give back to this nation that provides so many immigrants that opportunity to allow them to pursue happiness, right? The third part of our declaration of independence, with the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They provided them that opportunity for liberty, right? To avoid political and, and racial oppression and to pursue economic uh, prosperity, happiness, property, uh, start their own business, et cetera. 
Uh, they were given that opportunity here that they were not in the countries where they came from. So it was my obligation to get back. And then third, after 9-11, I started getting a little bit more into the study of international relations, American foreign policy, history, just understanding. I was 18 years old. This dramatic thing happens that just changes the world. I'm now an adult. I'm going to be part of this. It happens right when I'm 18. So I'm young. I'm of combat age. So I know now that the world is about to change and my world's about to change. I better start studying up on this. So I really immersed myself in the study of international relations and understanding what our role was and what we've done historically as a, as a nation, not always perfect, but what we were able to do in the post-World War II global order, right? The, the brilliant minds of the Truman administration who evaluated the history of human affairs and all the steps that resulted in this disaster known as World War II that nothing today compares to. The history of humans and tribes invading other tribes, nations invading other nations for resources, for whatever it was, what the Great Depression, the trade wars, the global war, what created that and what could we do to create a better world? And everyone always says they want to create a better world. The people who worked in the Truman administration actually did that. They really evaluated the history of human affairs and attempted to create a global order that, while not perfect, helped to create stability, helped open markets for commercial trade versus in invasions for resources, a global order with the United States playing the, the lead role in that. And you can argue that since that time, we've had the greatest period of human prosperity, expansion of freedom throughout human history. And I can't advocate for those beliefs and principles without putting my money where my mouth is. So if I believe that military is a critical component to creating global peace and prosperity to save people like my parents who came from oppressive areas and po extreme poverty to help them out, to do our part, to create a better world, because our country is made up of people from all over the world. So it's a rightful place to do that. I had to be willing to put my life on the line to live up to those ideals. And those were the reasons why I joined after 9-11 and signed up to go in the army. And I didn't know if I was going to Iraq or Afghanistan. I was hoping Afghanistan because I had believed in in that uh, war much more than I did in, in the Iraq war. Not to say that the, the Iraq war and the veterans who fought there weren't trying there, you know, to do, to make the world a better place as well. The initial component of where 9-11 came from was in Afghanistan. What don't people know about the war in Afghanistan that would absolutely blow their minds if they did? I think two things. I don't think people understood the lack of troops that we, we had there. And then of course, the whole lack of a viable political solution. I don't think people are, are, have been informed enough by, because I don't even think the leaders in Washington understand that the, the incorrect political solution that was attempted there, but the troop to population ratio, as an example, when I was there in 2007 for my first deployment, we were one brigade for the entire Eastern Afghanistan. And, and actually in all of Afghanistan, we had one army infantry brigade combat team at that time there, uh, third brigade, 10th mountain division. Compared to Iraq, which was in the midst of the surge, they had 20. So 20 to one wow. was the ratio. You looked at the drones, the predators that were the predator drones and, and everything that the air assets that we had to support us. You look at the map of the GIS above Iraq, it was full of assets. We had to fight for time with the predator, with special ops, with the CIA, with others to have that support. So we had, I remember in first deployment, we had one platoon minus, which is roughly just under 20 soldiers to secure a province of 300,000 people. You're not going to do that. So our troops were asked to do the impossible. They were not resourced. They were not staffed. They were put at risk by the lack of resources, by the whole politicization of troop numbers. We were always put at risk and we were spread so thin that it was impossible to do a, a successful counterinsurgency operation. The kinetic component was made much more difficult, which is why the Taliban kept gaining strength each year while we were there. So that's one thing. Even when we did the surge with the, the Obama administration, we got up to 10 brigade combat teams. Remember I told you Iraq had 20. Afghanistan is a much more difficult terrain to operate. Very mountainous and the people there, like you mentioned earlier, have a strong history of driving out great powers and being successful in doing so. So to have underestimated the ability of the Taliban and those who are allied with them to win the rural mountainous areas and to be successful kinetically was a big mistake. And I don't think that the American people understood really how under uh, resourced our troops were that were over there. And the fact that we pursued a flawed political strategy with the bond agreement and the creation of a strong unitary state 
in Afghanistan and a strong centralized government in Kabul, which is completely antithetical to Afghan history of successful governance models, which are more localized, local tribes empowered. And all the central government does is help keep negotiate peace between tribes and represent them internationally. That would have been the better model to empower locals. Remember again, when the locals were, it's not the perfect solution that we would expect from a modern form of governance, but it was a stable solution. And with education, with economic support and cultural exchange and long-term investments, they themselves could, could build up their own nation and achieve what we would consider a better form of governance. But we tried to impose this heavily bureaucratized central government out of Kabul. People in the rural areas and other provinces did not want Kabul dictating to them. The thought of creating an Afghan national police, we don't even have that here in the United States. We have local police. They created a national police in Afghanistan, which was extremely corrupt, which was not legitimate. And we invested so much in a failed pol national police force instead of focusing our efforts on a, an effective Afghan army to, again, do that mission of helping keep the Taliban out and trying to keep peace between the local warlords or tribes, if you want to call it, who, who work with us to keep the Taliban out. We didn't take that solution. We decided to, again, to create that strong government and it was illegitimate. It lacked political support and it gave a perfect inroad to those elements that were anti-government to start fighting back. Again, I don't think the American people understand that we, we lacked successful political strategy that there was an effective political strategy. So how could I figure that out when I was 25 years old, working on these issues and seeing progress there? If I could figure that out, I didn't understand how older, more seasoned people back in Washington cannot figure out a simple concept like that. And it's because I think we outsource the political strategy to the global community, who is not always a good player, if you will, in understanding complex issues, building local governments. It's a one size fit all modern European style governance in places that don't need that. Their culture is completely antithetical. They don't want that. It's not to say they don't want freedom, but again, you can argue they're more Jeffersonian than we were. They wanted more local control than central control. And that's not a bad thing. You could create a, a governance structure that could have been viable there while also keeping the local people armed. We disarmed them in 2005, big mistake keep making sure our allies were armed so they could defend themselves and keep the Taliban out. So again, 2005 was the key year that the Taliban started coming back. That's when we disarmed the people, the tribes, and we introduced our allies, uh, European allies of NATO to the South and the, the people there were not too, too happy about that. So I want to understand the level of effectiveness and power of the U.S. military. So if you were to put the U.S. military head-to-head -head Rocky IV style against, say, China today? How would the U.S. military fare, in your opinion? I don't think I can answer that in terms of today. I could answer that certainly when I was in the 2000s. There's no competition. We were seasoned. We had experienced combat. We were very effective in the kinetic components of warfare uh, that you can see with the 2003 invasion of Iraq, 2001 quick defeat of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Our military is very good at conventional warfare. I haven't followed the military enough over the last 10 years. I've separated myself emotionally. It was very depressing coming out of the military and, and my experience in Afghanistan. And I've begun focusing more on local government here on the state side. That's become my passion. I'm not sure what kind of naval and air power, how we would stack up with China today. But I can certainly say that back then there was no comparison, at least from a, a seasoned combat veteran, we were very effective and efficient in what we could do in terms of kinetic operations. But I don't know enough to answer that today, but I, I do hear some disturbing reports about that very issue, about our ability to continue to contend. So uh, I hope we don't lose that. What are you hoping people will take away from the last 20 years of the U.S. being in Afghanistan? First and foremost, I think they need to take away the sacrifice of our Gold Star families. And those who never came back, that's who, especially right now, this weekend, Memorial Day weekend, um, when we're doing this broadcast, they really can't forget that. Again, these are the best people and, and we lost them. So that's first and foremost is to, to not forget that, to not forget that we do have friends around the world, that most people are the same, that we all aspire to have family and to have peace and prosperity. It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It, it is true. Uh, from a psychological perspective, most people just want to be safe, secure, and be able to pursue economic prosperity and take care of their families. Most people are the same. I don't care what religion, race, et cetera. And we have friends in Afghanistan and we should not forget them. 
We have to do whatever we can to continue to help them because you don't have a friend to help you out like they did with us, with our objectives of defeating Al Qaeda as our first objective, which they did. They helped us do that. So a friend helps you out and then you abandon them. From a moral standpoint, I, I, I find a lot of issue with that. And, and I hope we don't forget that. We should also take away that we did our best. Those who went there, even though we, we may not have been successful, we did the best with the limited control we had over the situation. We gave it our all. Even those who weren't seriously injured or died, a lot of them gave up a lot in terms of their personal lives. And you just look at the divorce rates, even with myself, right? You just look at the divorce rates of the veterans who went through that, came back through the Great Recession. So when a lot of us were getting out, we were in the midst of the Great Recession, couldn't find jobs. So we just fought a war for the country and then we come back and we can't find jobs. So the majority of my soldiers, we were all struggling at that point. So it took a huge toll on us, uh, in our personal lives, our, our ability to function. However, it's also helped us. I am you know, the person I am today, first and foremost, because of the wisdom of my parents and what they imbued in me, my education, undergrad and graduate, what, what I put into that to learn all that I could about the world and management and governance and, and everything else. And my experience in Afghanistan, that is what shaped me the most out of any work experience for understanding how things truly work. When you're a child, you think that adults have their together. And then as you become an adult, you realize that's not the case. Organizationally, we struggle mightily. And I had to learn that as a naive, young, 20 uh, something year old going to a war that no, we don't know what we're doing. Cross agency coordination just does not happen. Management science is forgotten. And so I had to learn all those things as a young person. And I hope we don't lose sight of that as a nation, even though we have that important role to play that our U.S. is still an important role since the post-World War II era. I don't believe our leadership, our political system and structure is up to the task anymore. I really don't. And that's frightening for me. I think the World War II generation, while they had their faults, at least from a management and competence standpoint, I think they had to grow up very young. But my generation, I had to grow up very young. And I think that's why I'm affected today in what, what I do. So you had so many people who had to go through that in World War II. So you had a class of competent people who understood organization. And I think they helped us become prosperous. And if you notice, since the last of the World War II, leadership started tailing off. Our ability to manage foreign affairs and domestic affairs, I argue, has begun to slide. Our technology advances are still wonderful. Our private sector still delivers. Our military is great, but I think we lack effective, competent leadership and management. And so we're not up to the task anymore. So I would be highly skeptical of any further military uh, interventions for our ability to be successful because I just don't trust the leadership in Washington uh, to figure out how to manage it properly. When I was there, it was quite obvious that none of them had ever been uh, in a situation, in a war or an encounterinsurgency, and those who were, like Colin Powell and John McCain, were ignored about what needed to be done to be successful. So again, I would be highly skeptical of any future ventures. And it's tough against the dichotomy because if we don't continue to play this role, the world can become a much worse place. But I just have lost faith in our ability to manage that effectively. Laszlo, thank you so much. Just incredibly enlightening. I want to just ask some general advice and lessons learned questions. If you could share one secret of your success, what would that be? Well, I learned it very early on with my parents. It's just outworking others. And you hear it in sports as well. I know it's cliched, uh, but you hear it from people like Michael Jordan and others, just the amount of work that they put into it. If, if you're tru truly looking to accomplish goals and you define those goals, you got to really work hard at it. And that's what I did at all levels. So at the collegiate level, I was the one Friday night, Saturday night in the library at 2 a.m. versus out and drinking. So that that's how I ended up getting into Harvard. It wasn't because I was naturally gifted. It, it was really a lot of hard work and effort. And then the military as well. I, I spent a lot of time just studying Afghanistan and Afghan history and like counterinsurgencies and doing my best to just master those concepts so I can test out those theories when I was on, on the ground there. So I think outworking everyone is critical. The big privilege that I have is, is just, again, having two great parents. Not everyone has that. So you should try to be the best parent. I think that that's critical to help your, your child be successful and focusing on things that you can control. That was one of the big things that I struggled with after Afghanistan was just, it took me a while to learn that life lesson that you can't kill yourself over uh, things that you don't have control over. You really got to focus on what you can control and try to do the best at that.
If you could offer one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? Well, I always advocate for us looking to the stars and becoming explorers again, breaking down barriers, becoming one world uh, human race that tries to lift up our species and all the species here on Earth as well, who really are counting on us to ensure their survival long after Earth is gone. That's, I think, going to drive the best of humanity is unifying and looking to the stars and trying to get to other places and uh, spread our species out uh, as best we can. I think that's an exciting prospect that would drive ingenuity, innovation, and give a shared purpose. How do you want to be remembered? So I think I would want my daughter to remember me as one of her favorite people ever <laughs> and a great dad. I'm not sure I want to be remembered, but I would love my work, and my ideas to, to be remembered. I'm always concerned when we try to deify people. I'm always more interested in their ideas and their actions. What did they do? As humans, we're all fallible, right? We all make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. We should be also judged uh, by our best actions, our ideals, and what we did and try to make our communities or the world a better place. Do you have any final thoughts for us? I've asked you a lot of questions. Just want to open up the floor for you. If there's anything yeah. else that you want to share? Yeah, just just for everyone again, just uh, not to forget our, our Gold Star families and the memory of those who we lost over the last 20 years. It's very emotional, the, this upcoming 9-11 and the fact that we're, we're getting out. We're potentially accepting defeat and allowing the Taliban to reestablish itself 20 years after we, we set up on that mission. It's, it can be quite depressing. Again, I try to focus on what I can control, but it's hard to sit back and just not think about the people who are going to suffer uh, because of this. Where can people find and connect with you online? I do have a LinkedIn account, so that's probably the best way I do. I do check messages that way and I'm always open to discussing Afghanistan and, and trying to in part, at least my experience and what I learned from there as well. Laszlo, this has been an incredible conversation, it, just beyond illuminating. And the, the context and the background that you shared on a subject that I feel it's misunderstood and little understood, I think, by the general public. It was just incredibly helpful. And I think it really filled in a lot of knowledge gaps for me personally, and I think will for our listeners. Before we close out the conversation, I just want to thank you for your time spending it with me today. And I also want to thank you for your service to our country, both in the past and in the present as well. So thank you for being with me today, Laszlo. Thank you, Mark, for talking about this issue and giving a veteran a chance to discuss. I think it's good to hear from multiple veterans' voices right now. And then we're all going to have different opinions and, and that's okay. But it's important for us to discuss this, this issue because it was an important part of our, our lives and, and we hope uh, for the best when we pour. Absolutely. We need more people like you in the world and more people like you talking in the world. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, Laszlo, again. Thank you, Mary. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, click the subscribe button to get the latest content and check out these other great clips from the podcast.